all cars. A copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Oakland Police calling all cars, attention all cars. Investigate a fire at 7052 Tracona Avenue. A fire at 7052 Tracona Avenue. That's all. unfold in this evening's story, notice how efficient modern police methods are. How the alertness of modern fire departments saves lives and property. Notice how important motor performance becomes in the split-second activities of law enforcement agencies. As you hear the sirens of fire engines and police cars, as you thrill to the powerful throb of their motors, keep in mind that it is Rio Grande cracked gasoline that is giving life to this dramatic program. The police of not only Oakland, where this true drama originated, but Berkeley, Fresno, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, San Diego, Orange County, San Diego County, Maricopa, the largest county in Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties have specified Rio Grande cracked gasoline month after month for all their police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. More Rio Grande cracked gasoline is used wherever it is sold for saving life and property than any other brand. You can have this same police car performance in your car because your independent Rio Grande dealer offers you exactly the same Rio Grande cracked gasoline police cars use. Try a tank full tomorrow. We take you now to our San Francisco studios where you will hear Chief W.G. Lutke of the Oakland Fire Department, Chief Lutke. Good evening. Tonight I have been asked to explain the actual way in which the Oakland Arson Squad functions. In order to do that, I would have to have the entire half hour set aside for calling all cars and perhaps a great many more half hours. So I won't attempt the impossible. Briefly, though, the Arson Squad works in complete cooperation with both the fire department and the police at all times. When a battalion chief finds anything of a suspicious nature at the scene of a fire, he immediately notifies the fire marshal who in turn informs the police and together they begin an investigation. It is this close harmony between the various departments that is responsible for the record we in Oakland have, 27 convictions for arson in the last two and a half years. It was this same spirit of cooperation that made it possible for us to eventually arrest and convict the arsonist responsible in the case you are about to hear. In closing, I should like to add that although the arson, that arson is one of the most difficult of all crimes to solve, the scientific strides that have been taken in the last few years are rapidly making it more and more impossible for a person to get away with it. Science alone is a tremendous foe to grapple with. But when science is teamed with organization, then you have an adversary impossible to beat. <laughs> October 12, 1935. Faintly illuminated by a cloud-shot moon, a small house squats complacently on its redwood foundation, oblivious of its surroundings, seemingly a thing asleep. No sound disturbs the silence of the night. Then, slowly, furtively, a shadowy figure slips out of the darkness, glides noiselessly to a point just below the kitchen window, crouches there like some hunted thing. A sudden spurt of flame lights the scene, reveals a man's face, tense, sweat streaked, eyes staring straight before him to the tiny flame from a match. For a brief instant, he pauses, then slowly edges the burning match to a pile of crumpled newspapers, watches with grim satisfaction as small tongues of red flame grow larger, devour each other in their greediness to reach a tastier morsel, the house itself.
Suddenly, the man tears his eyes away from the glowing flames, casts a quick look about, then glides back into the shadows as quietly as he arrived. No sound is heard but the ominous crackling of burning wood. No movement seen except a thin wisp of smoke that filters upward into the silent house above. Minutes tick by. The smoke grows denser, penetrates the flooring, spirals into the kitchen, the living room, the bedroom, where Mrs. William Reinhardt lies asleep in her bed. But restlessly, she throws an arm out, brushes away the dream that is disturbing her slumbers. Then suddenly she sits up, awake, coughing, fear closing her throat. Smoke. Oh, there's smoke coming in my room. <coughs> The room is full of it. Frank! William! Frank! Get out! The house is on fire! Frank! Quick! <coughs> the house is on fire! I'm coming, Mom! Get Tony out! I'll call the fire department! Never, what's the matter with Catherine? The house is on fire, William! Wake Tony and get out! Operator! Operator! This is Operator speaking. Give me the police station. The house is on fire. What is the address, please? Oh, 7052 Tacoma. Tell him to hurry. I will notify the fire department for you. Okay, but hurry, will you? Tell them the place is on fire. And again, fire department? Fire at 7052 Tracoma Avenue. 7052 Tracoma? Right. Battalion Chief Terry, firemen succeed in subduing the blaze before it has done much damage. But as the hungry flames sullenly give way to the stream of water being played on them, Chief Terry stops suddenly, turns to a fireman beside him. George. Hey, sir. Tell the boys not to disturb anything more than is absolutely necessary under the house there. Try to save everything you can. You think it's arson, awesome, Chief? Yeah, looks like it. I don't want to destroy any evidence there might be. Well, I'll take care of it right now, sir. Right. I'm going to find a phone call Marshal Carlson. I think he'll be interested in what I found. Instructed by Fire Marshal Carlson to gather all the evidence he can and save it for him, Chief Terry returns to the scene to await Carlson's arrival. Well, I saved everything I could, Chief. I left everything just as it was. Good. Uh, there's some newspapers all crumpled up. Of course, they could have been under the house before, but... Uh, mm, they could have been. Don't think they were, though. Uh, the people that live are inside. I told them to stay around until you got back. Much damage in there? Oh, no, sir. None to speak of. A little water got on the walls and the floors, but there's no fire. Yeah, they're pretty lucky. If this had gotten another 15-minute start, we might have lost the whole house. This word wood burns like tinder. That's probably the marshal now. Made pretty good time. Yeah. Well, stand by here and don't let anybody touch anything. I'm going out to the street and meet him. Yes, sir. I'll keep my eyes on him. Hello, marshal. Well, you certainly didn't lose any time getting here. Ah, I'm still half undressed. What's the trouble here? Oh, I had a little fire under the house. No trouble putting it out. But I found some stuff I thought you'd be interested in. Smelled what might have been kerosene smoke, too. Mm. Let's take a look. Nothing's been disturbed. One of the boys is back there standing guard. This way. Have you talked to the people who live here yet? No. George has, though. They're inside waiting for us. Good. Well, here's where the fire started. In this lattice place under the kitchen window. You see? Yeah. Hmm. Newspapers. Half burned. Yeah. That's what made me think this wasn't an accidental fire. Lucky. That and the kerosene smell. Mm, lucky these papers didn't burn. They were crammed in so tightly there wasn't enough air to let them burn. And that's the only thing that stopped them. Throw that light over here, will you? Yes, sir. And that's got it. Huh. Burned all the under timbers and started on the floor joists, huh? Yeah. A little more time and the thing would have been plenty hot. Now, wait a minute. Lower that light again to where it was a second ago. A little more. There, hold it. What's up? Maybe nothing. Only half-burnt matches lying near half-burnt newspapers usually mean someone meant there to be a fire. The way I figure. My gosh, you're right. That is a match. Hold that light till I get it. There we are. Well, not much to work on. One burnt match. Plus a newspaper. Plus a distinct kerosene odor. I've worked on less. You stick here a minute while I go out to my car, will you? 
I've got my equipment out there, and I want to make some tests. That way, we'll have positive evidence when we need it. With infinite care and patience, Marshal Carlson makes several tests, finds traces of kerosene on the paper as well as the lattice work under the window. Then, satisfied with his efforts there, he and Chief Terry interview the occupants of the house. Now, first of all, if you'll give me your name. William Reinhardt. William Reinhardt. You live here, Mr. Reinhardt? Yes, this is my wife my two sons, Frank and Anthony. Thank you. Now, who discovered the fire? Well, I guess I did. I was asleep, and I must have been dreaming, because I remember a lot of things that I'm sure didn't happen. It was a clear... Uh, Mrs. Thought... Reinhardt, may I interrupt you for a minute? Why, of course. I appreciate the fact that dreams often are strange and all that, but right now the primary point of interest is the fire. Well, yes, of course. That's what I was leading up to, the fire. Oh, all right. Now, suppose you tell me what happened after your dream. You woke up, and what happened? Well, I found the room all full of smoke. It was choking me, and I couldn't see anything. Where did the smoke seem to be coming from? Coming from? Well, I don't think that entered my mind. I was so upset and nervous. I just knew that there was smoke, and that was enough. Enough for what, Mrs. Reinhardt? Enough to make me want to get out, naturally. Isn't that the usual thing for a person to do when they find themselves in a house that's burning down around them? Of course. I'm sorry to seem inquisitive, Mrs. Reinhardt. I don't want you to think that I'm deliberately trying to confuse you. Well, you're doing just that. Then I'm sorry. Unfortunately, in the case of this type, there are so many little things that are important to us that we have to ask these questions. Well, the man's right, dear. He's only trying to help us. Well, I, I'm i sorry. I, I've been in such a state of nerves that I'm, I'm afraid I've been terribly rude. I'll try to answer your question. Thank you. Now, before you tell me the actual happenings, that is, what you did when you woke up, can you think of anyone who might want to burn this house? I know. Why do you ask that? Because that fire was started by someone who meant to do just that. You mean to say it wasn't just an accidental thing, that uh, someone tried to burn us? They may not have wanted to burn you, but the house is. Well, I've never heard of such a thing. You can't think of anyone who might have done it, can you, Mr. Reinhardt? Hey, of course not. William, hmm? you don't think... Lawrence? Oh, but he, he wouldn't do this, would he? He couldn't. Who is Lawrence, Mrs. Reinhardt? Uh, why, uh... He's a, uh, a friend of ours. Yes, uh, you'd better tell him who is there. Oh, but he couldn't do such a thing. He wouldn't dare. Well, Mrs. Reinhardt, I'm afraid you'll have to tell me who this person is. It may be of vital importance. Well, all right. I, I suppose it can't hurt any if he didn't do it. That's right. Lawrence Stafford was my first husband. I divorced him 20 years ago. I see. Oh, no, but you don't. You haven't heard what happened. What did happen? Well, we were on very friendly terms. We wrote to one another and all that. And then after I married Mr. Reinhardt, we sort of drifted apart for a while, and I didn't hear from him. Then one day I received a letter from him, a long letter, explaining why I hadn't heard from him and saying that he was getting married. Also, that he was going to live on in Tucson with his new wife and asking me to keep an eye on his property here in Oakland. Uh, this house is his. Well, what makes you feel that he had something to do with this fire? If this is his property, I shouldn't think he'd want to destroy it. Well, I can explain that. You see, after that letter, I had several more. And in one, he said that he was going to lose the property and asked me to assume the indebtedness. He asked me to send him a gift deed, which he'd sign and return to me, which I did. And then, uh, after Mr. Reinhardt and I moved in here, the, uh, the other letters began. What other letters, Mrs. Reinhardt? Well, the ones that I, I can't understand. Abusive, mean, threatening letters. Threatening? In what way? Well, he said that I'd tricked him into signing the deed. That he wanted the house back, and he meant to get it or else know the reason why. And he used language that didn't sound like him, I... I just don't understand it uh, at all. Mrs. Reinhardt, you don't happen to have any of those letters, do you? Yes, I do. I kept them. For some reason I can't explain. But you kept them. That's the main thing. Yes. I'm going to ask you for them, Mrs. Reinhardt. Oh, dear, I, I, I hate to cause any trouble. If this man is not responsible for the fire tonight, I promise you these letters will be kept absolutely private. Well, all right, then. I, I'll get them for you. If you'll excuse me, I'll find them. And a few minutes later, Marshal Carlson, in company with police inspectors Tracy and Anderson, begins the task of reading the threatening letters. There are several of them. And some time passes before Carlson suddenly breaks the silence. Here's something. Yeah, what? Listen to this. It says, I'm getting tired of your stalling around. It makes me so mad that sometimes I wish the house would burn down. What do you think of that? Well, it might mean a lot, and then again, it might not mean anything. I... I've never put it in a letter, but I thought the same thing a lot of times, you know, as a sort of an expression. Yeah, I know. But in this case, 
I have a hunch it means just what it says. Miss Stafford still live at the same place? I don't know. That's one of the things we've got to find out. It should be easy enough. If he started that fire tonight, he's obviously not in Tucson. Well, we could check with the Arizona authorities and find out what they know about him. All right. You'd better take care of that, Anderson, while Tracy and I do a little looking around the premises. I've got an idea there must be a container or a bottle somewhere near that was used to carry the kerosene in. And I want to find it. If we do find this fellow, we'll need every bit of evidence we can scrape up to pin it on him. And that's just what we're going to get. Accordingly, Inspector Anderson returns to headquarters and Carlson and Tracy begin a thorough search of the surrounding territory. For some time, they browse through the yard, in the garage. Everywhere there might be a clue. Finding nothing, they are about to give up when suddenly Carlson raises a hand. Wait a minute, Tracy. Kill the flashlight. Hey, what's up? A few minutes ago, a car went by the house here, remember? Yeah. What about it? It just struck me that this is a dead-end street, and that car hasn't come back. Why not? Well, it's probably just a couple of kids out to enjoy a little privacy. Look at the moon or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Maybe. But I want to get a look at it anyway. Come on. Okay. And keep that flash off. I want to see without being seen. Right. We can cut over this vacant lot here. Get a look at them that way. All right. You'll probably find it's nothing, though. Maybe so. Mm -hmm. But I've got a hunch, and I've learned to follow them when they happen. Yeah, good enough. What can we lose anyway? Easy now. They should be parked somewhere over that little rise ahead of us. Huh, there they are. Right where I figured they'd be. Yeah, it looks like they're just sitting. Yeah. But take a look at those license plates. Huh? Say. Yeah. Arizona plates. And the gentleman who wrote those letters is from Arizona. Come on. Let's talk to them. Yeah, okay. Enjoying the scenery? Say, oh, what? Oh, 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 where, where'd you come from? Back there a little ways. Noticed your car here and thought I'd come over. A friendly type, eh? Well, we're not interested in conversation. We'd appreciate being left alone. Well, that's too bad. Have you ever seen one of these before? Why, why, sure. It's a badge. Well, are you an officer? Fire Marshal Carlson and Inspector Tracy. Oh, well, I'm... Sorry I was so rude. I thought you were just some nosy person that wanted to talk or something. I, I didn't know you were an officer. That's all right. Do you mind answering a few questions? Why, no. No, of course not. I don't know what good I can do, but Perhaps I... Perhaps you wouldn't mind telling me what you're doing here. Well, we thought it was a nice night, and we took a drive, that's all. You familiar with this spot? No. Never saw it before, as a matter of fact. How about you, ma'am? Why, no. You see, we're from out of town, and... Well, it was such a lovely night. We we just sort of thought we'd drive around. I have to drive because my husband has been ill. And... I see. What's your name? Mine. That's right. Oh, uh, Rose. Rose Smith. Are you Mr. Smith? Yes, that, that, that's right. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to stay right here with me for a little while. Tracy, run back to the house and get Mr. Reinhardt for me, will you? I want to see if he knows Mr. and Mrs. Smith. <laughs> Marshal Carlson's hunch bears fruit when Mr. Reinhardt arrives on the scene. Mr. Reinhardt, do you know this man? Why, of course. That's Lawrence Stafford. Lawrence Stafford? Why, I never heard of anyone by that name. You you must be confused or you something. You mean to stand there and face me with that lie? What do you mean, lie? Why, you have a nerve? Well, not nearly as much All as you. All right, gentlemen. Save the argument. Tracy, watch these two while I look through the car. Okay. <clears throat> All right, come on. Get out of the car, both of you. Well, I never heard of anything so disgraceful in my life. Being pulled out of your own car like Come some... on, Stop. come on. Get out of the car. I'll, I'll, I'll get out. But I'll see that someone pays for sure, this. Sure, I know all about it. Now stand right there and keep quiet. You too, ma'am. Well, let's see what's in here. Well, well, well. Now, isn't that interesting? Hey, what you find? Just a small item. A gallon jug with kerosene in it. Come on, Tracy. Let's take Mr. and Mrs. Smith to the station. <laughs> Taken to the Oakland police station, the couple are booked on suspicion of arson and lodged in jail. Then Marshal Carlson makes a complete search of their car. And a little while later in his office, he examines the numerous bits of evidence, then sends for Stafford. Stafford, let's stop all this foolishness and get down to facts. My name's not Stafford. Your name is Stafford, and the sooner you give up this bluff, bluff the better it's going to be for you. I've got enough evidence here to send you away for a long time. Listen. I don't know what evidence you're talking about, and I don't know what I'm supposed to have done. But I tell you, you've got the wrong person. 
Anderson, bring me that stuff from over there, will you? Yeah, sure. A few things we found in your car, Stafford. I'd like to have you explain them to me. What's wrong with having a bottle in a car? What were you using this kerosene for? I... My wife bought it. She was going to clean the spark plugs on the car. So she bought a gallon. Yes. That's a lot of kerosene just to clean a few little spark plugs. Well, that's her business, not mine. How about this 38 automatic? That her business, too? I... I carry that for protection. Of course. I imagined that would be your answer. Now, one more thing. I noticed among your effects a handful of table matches. They were in your coat pocket. You in the habit of carrying matches? Well, sure. Why not? Everybody does. That's true enough. But not everybody carries the same kind of matches that were used to start a fire with. And not everybody carries a gallon jug of kerosene. And not everybody happens to be just riding around a block away from the scene of a fire with all these things. You're just wasting your time with all that talk because I didn't have anything to do with any fires or anything else. Perhaps your wife will feel differently. She's had time to think it over. Take this man out, Anderson, and get me his wife. Well, Mrs. Stafford, are you ready to talk to me? About what? About a lot of things. First of all, why you said your name was Smith tonight? What was your reason for that? Well, it is Smith. No good, Mrs. Stafford. I just talked to your husband, Mr. Stafford. And he said... He did. Oh. Now, how about getting it off your chest? Well, uh... Well, as a matter of fact, I, I did say my name was Smith because I, I was nervous and I didn't want to be involved in any trouble. And, well, I thought that was the best thing to do. Oh, it was silly, and I realize that now. What were you doing parked out there tonight? I, um, well, um, we were looking for an apartment, and we read about one that sounded right, and, well, well, we were looking for it, that's all. On a place to look for an apartment, Mrs. Stafford, on a dead-end road parked with the lights out. Well, that's what we were doing. All right. We'll pass that up for the moment. Now about your husband. Why did he try to burn that house down? I don't know what you mean. You don't remember anything about how Mrs. Reinhardt's house was set on fire? I certainly don't. I didn't even know it had been. You're in a pretty tight spot, you know. I don't know anything about All that. All right, then. We'll just sit here and talk until you do remember. <laughs> Marshal Carlson questions the woman. And for hours, she denies everything. At last, he sends her back to her cell, then calls Inspectors Tracy and Anderson in. Can you get anything out of her? Not much. She admits to being Mrs. Stafford, and I got an address of the place where they're staying. That's about all. Yeah, what now? I want to go out to this address and look around a bit. Also, we might go to every place that sells kerosene and see if we can find who sold it to them. I think if we face Stafford with a witness, he might talk. If he would, it might save a lot of time and trouble for the courts. Because talk or no talk, I'm going to send those two up for arson. And after investigating the apartment where Stafford and his wife have been living, Carlson begins the tedious job of checking each place where kerosene is sold. It is a thin chance. But after several unsuccessful attempts, he locates a small gas station near the scene of the fire where the attendant recognizes the description of the Staffords. He says he sold them the kerosene. But when Stafford is faced with this new development, his answer remains the same. He denies ever having seen the attendant in his life. Two weeks go by in which Carlson prepares an ever-tightening noose of evidence. And finally, when it's complete... He turns it over to the district attorney's office and sets a date for trial. Then, on the morning of December 9, 1935, the Stafford's attorney enters a plea of not guilty, and the trial begins. Silently, the suspects listen as Fire Marshal Carlson testifies. Produces one piece of evidence after another. <laughs> now, Mr. Carlson, the court has seen with their own eyes the jug of kerosene which you found in the Stafford's car. They have heard the explanation of why it was there. Will you tell in your own words exactly what took place the night you arrested them in their car? <clears throat> I asked the lady her name, and she told me it was Ruth. Uh, would you talk a little louder, please? Yeah. I asked the lady her name, and she told me it was Rose Smith. She also told me that the man with her was her husband, Mr. Smith. Then I asked them what they were doing there, and they both said they were just taking a ride. I thought it was kind of funny their being there and all. So I asked Inspector Tracy to go back to the house and get Mr. Reinhardt. He did that. And while he was gone, I talked to the suspects some more. They were very nervous. Didn't seem very happy over the prospects of meeting Reinhardt. Your Honor. And, and... <laughs> Your Honor, my clients 
have asked me to withdraw the plea of not guilty and enter one of guilty. In doing this, may I ask the court to be lenient. Mr. and Mrs. Stafford realize the error of their ways, realize that what they have done in a moment of weakness is bad. But surely, Your Honor, the fact that they have repented, that they only want now a chance to begin again, surely that should appeal to the mercy of the court. Your Honor, I... Mr. Haller, this court is a place of justice, not a bargaining mark. I shall have to ask you to refrain from any more irregularities. Court's adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow. But despite the last-minute attempt to save the Staffords, they were found guilty of arson and sentenced to serve from 2 to 20 years in San Quentin. Once more, we wish to emphasize the difference between Rio Grande cracked gasoline and ordinary gasoline. Rio Grande cracked with tetraethyl starts quicker, burns more completely, and therefore develops the driving, pulsating power that you heard dramatized a few moments ago. That is why it is used in more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand. There's a difference, too, between Sinclair motor oils and ordinary motor oils. Careful refining, which removes all wax, petroleum jelly, and other impurities, makes Sinclair Pennsylvania and Sinclair Opaline two of the finest motor oils money can buy. Your independent Rio Grande dealer has the correct grade for your car. Ask him. Ask him also for free police money, which you can exchange for junior detective and G-man outfits to make some boy or girl happy. Learn all about it in Calling All Cars News, that thrilling movie, radio, crime, drama publication, which is also free at your Rio Grande dealers. Police calling all cars, attention all cars. A cancellation of broadcast 158 regarding a fire. Suspects in this case now in custody. That's all.